Chapter 7 The Clash of Empires Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. John 12, verse 31 Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea! For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Revelation 12, verse 12 The kingdom of God has been planted in the hostile territory of a rebel planet. Jesus ascended to the throne in heaven in order that he might govern and guide the advance of his kingdom on earth until all of his enemies here have been subdued. That this is the end in view has been established by reference to Old Testament prophecies like those found in Psalms 2, 72, 110, and Daniel 2 and 7. Footnote. More such prophecies could be appealed to. End footnote. Paul clearly affirms that this is the goal. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Revelation 12, in words borrowed from Psalm 2, speaks of Christ's destiny, to rule all nations with a rod of iron. However, the context of this statement emphasizes the opposition that the devil brings in his desperate but futile ongoing attempt to prevent this inevitable outcome, and of the warfare waged between Satan and the people of God before the final goal is realized. There is no uncertainty concerning outcome. The followers of Christ ultimately defeat Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Verse 11. This final line speaks of the battle becoming so fierce at times that it results in Christian martyrdom. This is no sham battle or war game. Unlike video game battles, we are engaged in a life and death struggle to rescue the souls of the lost. Paul, mixing the metaphors of an Olympic competition and natural warfare, wrote to encourage his co-worker Timothy to persevere. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Speaking of his own behavior with reference to such matters, Paul employs the same two metaphors of running a race and of fighting an opponent. He writes to the Corinthians, All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Although the victory of Christ's kingdom is assured, there remains, as Paul says, a genuine risk of loss to those individual participants who do not take their commission seriously. Peter, too, speaks of the need for self-discipline, sobriety, and vigilance in the warfare of the Christian who values his own soul's security. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Having established that the world is not a playground, but a battleground, it is necessary that we grasp the nature of the battle in which we are engaged, and the reason why it even exists. The Backstory Behind a Familiar Conflict Jesus' victory 2,000 years ago was the decisive step in the restoration of all that was originally lost by God. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The thing that was lost was man's original dominion over the world while in submission to Yahweh. It was as the Son of Man, the last Adam, that Jesus recovered this dominion on behalf of our race. The first Adam, as our representative, had lost this privilege for us. 
We know that God's original intention in creating the earth was that it should be inhabited by creatures sharing in his decision-making capacity, so that he could entrust to them the rule over a perfect creation. A man who has built up a business enterprise with the desire to leave its management ultimately in the hands of his own children may be able to relate to God's motivations in creating us. Yahweh's intentions for mankind were stated prior to the creation of the first humans. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God had already made all plants and animals to delight himself and his future children, but a man cannot leave the oversight of his business to his cat or his canary. Yahweh desired to create responsible bearers of his own image, possessing rationality, creativity, and volition, like himself. Therefore he made our first parents and commissioned them to bear many offspring who would cultivate and fill the earth. Their first assignment was to take over the care and maintenance of a special region that God had pre-cultivated for them, the Garden of Eden. God's ideal was that humans would be loyal children in his household and would appreciate the privilege of being entrusted with so great a stewardship. If they had remained faithful and obedient to their Creator, there is every reason to believe that this perfect planet would have been their home without interruption and without death, and our venerable first parents would still be living among us today. God never intended that mankind would live in heaven with the angels. The heavens are the Lord's, but the earth He has given to the sons of men. Have you ever wondered why God placed a forbidden tree in this perfect garden with the potential of stumbling his children? Or why he placed them in a garden inhabited by a malicious serpent? Wasn't God aware of the serpent's presence and intentions? Couldn't God have destroyed or removed the devil in order to prevent the fall of our first parents? The answer is actually quite simple. God did not wish to entrust full dominion over his creation to children whose trustworthiness had not yet been tested and thereby established. This required that our first parents be subjected to a test of loyalty before they could be entrusted with complete control. The serpent was a creation of God, and it was no mistake or oversight on God's part that it was placed in the same corner of the universe as were the first humans. The serpent had a purpose for being there. He and the tree with the forbidden fruit were intentional features of the perfect creation, providing humans with a constant alternative to test their required obedience and loyalty. A surgeon who has built a prestigious practice and wishes to leave it in the hands of his own children will first place them in medical school. As part of an education, they would be required to sit for the proper exams to determine their qualifications to do surgery so as to eventually take over his practice. By requiring that they be tested, is he setting them up for failure? No, just the opposite. He wants them to pass the exams and prove themselves qualified but only if they have mastered the requisite knowledge and surgical skills. While he wants to see them pass every test, he does not wish them to do so if they are not qualified. In the selection of those who will reign with God, the thing that qualifies the candidate is complete loyalty to God. It is in this qualification that our first parents, and all of us since, have had to be tested. Satan is the appointed tester. Footnote. The Greek word perasmos, translated tempter, also means tester, or one who assays or proves. End footnote. Our first parents failed the loyalty test. As a consequence, they were not permitted to eat of the tree of life, which would have allowed them to live forever as permanent regents of the planet. Instead, they would live out their finite lifetimes under the rule of that malevolent spirit who had animated the serpent. Satan gained and retains his control over mankind through deception. Had he wished, God could have accepted the results of the experiment as a failure and just folded up the cosmos as one does with a checkerboard after losing the game. He could have abandoned Project Earth to try again with another planet, and then another, and another, until he received the results he was seeking. This is not what God chose to do. Despite the treason of his children, God loved them too much to abandon them to their fate. When they had first disobeyed, he told them that he would stage a rescue operation for planet Earth. He, in the person of a human being, a descendant of theirs, would personally conquer the enemy who had deceived them, thus liberating them to follow him once again. 
Footnote, Genesis 3, 15. In this statement, I do not intend to suggest that this entire plan, as stated, was clearly communicated in this one verse. The details were to unfold through later revelation that he would provide to chosen messengers. End footnote. The entire Old Testament is the story of the general failure of mankind under the control of the enemy. It is also the story of a special family, that of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the nation of Israel which arose from them, whom God chose for a special mission. Yahweh's dealings with that nation began with the divine promise of global restoration through his future search and rescue operation. This would be accomplished by the Messiah, whom their nation would bring into the world. Revelation 12, a panorama of the warfare of the ages. The twelfth chapter of Revelation distills this message into a dramatic story of a woman, a dragon or serpent, a male child, and a company at war with the serpent. Revelation is the most debated and potentially confusing book in the canon of Scripture. Footnote. See my book, Revelation, Four Views, a Parallel Commentary. Nashville, Thomas Nelson Publishers, 1997, Revised and Updated, 2013. End footnote. Its ambiguity in some parts has intimidated many readers, discouraging them from any hopes of mastering its message. However, many of the truths revealed there are far too valuable to allow us to simply surrender to confusion in the face of the controversy. The twelfth chapter is such a section. There is no more complete and succinct summary in Scripture of the kingdom's warfare throughout the ages than that provided in John's vision. Happily, the chapter contains all the necessary clues, found in its frequent allusions to clearer parts of Scripture, to allow us to confidently decipher its message. There are three distinct scenes to this drama. Scene 1. On Earth. The first six verses describe a pregnant woman about to give birth and the hostile intentions of a dragon, serpent, to kill her child in its infancy. Then follows the birth of a male child and his subsequent ascension to heaven, after which his mother flees into the wilderness. Scene 2. In the Heavens. Verses 7 through 12 speak of a war in heaven and the downfall of the persecuting dragon who is cast out of heaven to carry out his hostile intentions upon the inhabitants of earth. Scene 3, Back on Earth. In verses 13 to 17, the woman's flight into the wilderness is rejoined and an ensuing warfare between the serpent and her other children is described. It is necessary that we free our minds from the notion that everything in the book of Revelation is about the so-called end times. Some parts, at least, clearly look back on past events. This will be seen to be the case in particular in this chapter. We shall see that it begins with the birth of Christ and declares the coming of salvation and the kingdom of God through his resurrection victory. It then summarizes the ongoing battle between his people and the kingdom of Satan, the warfare in which we find ourselves embroiled even to this day. That this is the scope of the passage will become clear as we examine each of its scenes individually. The first scene is comprised of verses 1 through 6. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days.